works where the random phase approximation for total correlation energy fails. And I think a lot of people tend to think that the random phase approximation is very, very good because it's, it's very time consuming to do. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out it's actually not. And even if you look at the, the homogeneous electron gas and look at the, the correlation model calculated in RPA here and compare with the exact one, you see that it's, it's, it's quite a bit off. So, um, but it's good for some things uh, and not so good for other things. <coughs> Okay, so I'll start by very briefly introducing how we can get these correlation energies from this adiabatic connection for correction dissipation theory and then discuss some different features about RPA and I will probably tend to focus on the failures because um, we're interested in, in improving upon RPA and um, to do this we use uh, time-dependent density functional theory and um, in particular um, it turns out that you cannot use a local adiabatic kernel for this, so we have to, to remote normalize and introduce non locality in these kernels. And I'll talk about how we do this, and I'll be a bit technical because this is probably the only audience I'll ever get by who might be a bit interested in this. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, some, some results of this, this new curve. Okay, so in, with this adiabatic connection for tracing dissipation theorem, we can uh, express the correlation energy in terms of the interacting response function and um, the non-interacting response function. So this expression here is exact if uh, chi naught here is the exact Coulomb response function and chi lambda is the exact response function for a system where the Coulomb interaction has been scaled by lambda. And so we can of course um, approximate the non-interacting response function by, by a response function obtained with some standard uh, uh, it's a correlation function like LDA. But the interactive response function is a bit more complicated. Uh, but we can use uh, TDDFT to express it in terms of the non interactive response function and an exchange correlation kernel. And this is just uh, this is the functional derivative of a time dependent uh, exchange correlation potential. So, and um, finally, if now this exchange correlation kernel is linear and lambda, and this is, the this is the case of exchange kernels. Then we can carry out the coupling constant integration and arrive at this expression here. So now, if we start by setting the exchange correlation kernel to zero, we get the standard random phase approximation. And this is still a non-trivial <coughs> approximation for the response function because we, we have the Coulomb interaction. And we obtain this expression here for the correlation energy. And this is uh, implemented in Tpol using a plane wave representation of the response function. And it's uh, very straightforward to use. This is, you do a standard DFT calculation, you have to convert some um, unoccupied states. But this is very simple if you use plane wave mode, then you can simply diagonalize the entire Hamiltonian in the end. And then you just do this, and then you get the, uh, the RPA. <laughs> but it is very well much more time consuming than the standard uh, full challenge calculations. And you cannot do two route systems uh, presently. Okay, so, so very nice things about RPA is that it, it naturally incorporates the Valls in track because it's, uh, it's non local. And so there's some particularly problematic cases like this one, graphene or messy services, where if we do a uh, similar local approximation for exchange correlation, you get very different results. For example, this very deep minimum here is obtained with LTA, and then up here we have PBE, and then the red one here is RPE. So I think the mere fact that you get such qualitative differences with similar local um, functionals is a bit alarming and probably tells you that, that we should not do these, these functionals. On the other hand, we know that Van der Waals interactions is important in this system. So we can try to use one of these uh, Van der Waals functionals, which is, which is shown here. And it gives something, uh, well, something entirely different. It does, does give rise to a binding, but it's a uh, binding quite far from the surface. And this is uh, essentially the absorption out here. So it, it seems to capture the, the, the last interactions. But if we compare to experiments, graphene actually adsorbs very close to the surface uh, in a region about 2 Armstrong. So and this we get if we do the, do the random phase approximation for this system. We actually get two minima, one which is a chemisorption minimum and one which is a physisorption minimum. 
And the same thing with cobalt. Now we don't really know how accurate the random phase approximation is for the system because there's no of exact or higher accuracy calculations for these systems, but we we sort of believe that, that the random phase approximation is the is the best possible um, choice for, for these systems. <coughs> it's in agreement with experiment at least. Now we try to do a transition and these molecules, the results are not so good. Um, in fact it's it's um, it's it's very much comparable to PBE, slightly worse than PBE, and in general our PA tends to underbind. Also, there's a certain um, dependence on the, on the input orbitals you use to evaluate your response function. If you use PV, you get something which is slightly better than if you use LTA. But it's not very nice that you have this dependence because of I mean, And then we rely on doing non self consistent calculations. Um, and we would like to, be, to have something where, well, maybe we can get something that's independent on orbitals, but we should at least have a sort of a consistent choice. And the consistent choice for RPA would be half three orbitals because it, in a certain sense, corresponds to time-dependent uh, half three theory. But no one is doing that because that gives very poor results. We we'll go on to recent results. Um, the situation is even worse. Now we get the much worse results than, than PV. The PV is the blue line here. It gives actually decent results, but RPA is not so good. And I mean, in some cases, we get an error of um, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 AD. So if we think back about the, the case of, of graphene on nickel, we might ask if, um, I mean, this, this minimum very close to the surface, that was essentially a consumption minimum. So there we have weak correlative interactions. So the question is if we can really trust these, um, these interactions where we know that our PA is not very good for covalent bonds. So, just to sum up about a little bit pros and cons in RPA. As I said, it's very good that we get, we get a very good description of, uh, of Andral's interactions. We have this natural non-locality. It's also, um, we have to, in, in this elevated connection, fluctuation dissipation theorem, it's natural to combine it with exact exchange, so we don't have the self-interaction uh, problem. And we don't have to worry about the exchange at all, because it's just exact. It also should, it's also been shown that it solves the CO puzzle. I mean, all semi-local functionals tend to give the wrong order of absorption of, of CO on, on platinum 101. But um, our PA corrects this and gives the right um, absorption size. It also gives a very good description of strong static correlation. For example, if in the case of, um, if you take, if you associate a hydrogen molecule, then um, all semi-local functionals will fail in the dissociation limit, but um, are able to produce the right dissociation limit. So the problems with RPA are, first of all, there's a very large self-correlation error. We don't have this first order self-interaction error that, that half three in exchange doesn't can cancel for a single electron system. But we have higher order self-correlation. And if you calculate the correlation energy of a hydrogen atom, you'll get 0 0.6 eV. I mean, if you didn't know anything and just saw these results while trying to implement this method, we we'll probably just move on and conclude that this method doesn't work because this number should be zero. And, and I mean, this is much worse than, than PBE or any other semi local um, approximation you can come up with. But it turns out that there's a very high degree of error cancellation when you consider any differences. So, a translation entities actually come up decent, but nevertheless, they're a bit worse than PBE. We always have this undermining and also the greasy identity. Of solids uh, are much worse than PV. So, we would like to improve this and uh, do something better than RPA. And when we consider RPA as a certain approximation within the time dependent density functional theory, it's very natural to try to, to include an, um, an exchange correlation kernel. So, RPA is obtained from this, uh, this equation for the response function when we neglect the exchange correlation kernel. But now, let's try to include it. And the simplest thing we can do is just uh, use adiabatic LDA. This is, uh, here we just, this is just the second functional derivative of the LDA, which is correlation energy. And um, this has been shown to work quite well if you consider excited states of, of, uh, of molecules and so on. So, so this is a natural choice. 
And we'll always try to, to include exchange because then, uh, then the kernel is linear and lambda and we don't have to evaluate the, the kernel for each value of, of, of lambda. Now it turns out that this approximation actually makes results much worse than RPA. First of all, it's, it's very difficult to converse the calculations, and second, when, if we can converse them, the results are worse than RPA. And to see what the problem is, we can turn to the homogeneous electron gas, and, um, and this was done by Line and Gross and in, uh, in 2000 already. <coughs> and um, we can um, look at the coupling constant error, it's correlation hole in Q space. Is the Fourier transform the correlation model. And um, because for this we have uh, exact parameter positions by, by Wang and Purdue, we can compare it. And if we look at, um, at RPA, it seems to be a bit too small. Uh, and if we look at, at ALDA, it seems to be well, pretty accurate up to a certain point, but then it becomes uh, too positive. And this is, uh, well, this corresponds to a very high density and this is actually a very low density. And these two cases are qualitatively similar. We get, I mean, but it's clear that the, the RPA is, uh, is, uh, is not that good at intermediate distances here. And it's nice to look at this because we can actually calculate the total correlation energy, energy by just integrating this from zero to infinity. So we can see that RPA will tend to underestimate or, may, or predict two negative correlation energies and ALDA will give two positive correlation entities. But it's actually worse than that for in the case of ALDA because this very slowly decaying tail here means that, well, this is what gives convergence problems if we do ALDA. But it also turns out that if we fully transform this, then we will we'll get the real space correlation hole to diverge to the original. So it's very ill behaved, I would say. Um, but we can also observe that, that the ALDA correlation over there, the green line, is, is pretty accurate up to the point where it becomes zero. And this happens at exactly 2 kf. And then, it, then all the trouble starts. And, but at this point, the exact correlation model is also very close to zero. And the same in the very low density energy. So now we're trying, instead of integrating from zero to infinity, we can try to calculate the correlation energy by just integrating up to, to 2 kf. And if we do that, we get actually a decent agreement with, uh, with the exact results. So here the blue line is the RPA. It's the correlation energy per, per electron. It's pretty much half in the lead off at a wide, wide range of densities. ALDA is, is too large for a wide range of densities. But if we, we take this R ALDA here, this, this truncated ALDA, where we only integrate to 2 kf, then we get pretty good results. And this corresponds to taking Half to exchange correlation curve and introducing a theta function. Just make a call of that when Q is equal to 2 kf. Now, if we look at the correlation model in real space, it also looks much better than well. For the ALDA, we see this divergence due to the slow decay in Q space. RPA underestimates, which gives rise to these uh, two negative correlation entities. But this uh, truncated, the red line here, truncated. Uh, Kernel gives rise to a, a pretty good description of the correlation model, at least better than seems. So in the end, we will of course have to do this for, uh, for real systems. So what we can do, we can just fully transform this truncated <coughs> kernel to real space. Uh, then we get this expression here. We, we have to, I mean, we made a part of on both the uh, Coulomb kernel and the exchange kernel. Um, and this depends, of course, on this, uh, this, this cutoff parameter 2kf, which depends on the density. So for an inhomogeneous system, we now just take this r, uh, r coordinate here and replace it by the, the difference between r and r prime, and we replace kf by the local curve kf. So this depends on density, but then um, if we have an inhomogeneous density, we just, uh, we just replace it by the local density. The only problem is that this is a, a two-point kernel, and it should be symmetric in R and R prime. So to obtain this, we, instead of the density, we use the average of the densities in, in, in R and R prime. So this is very much like the, I mean, if you plot this, it has a similar, a similar structure to the pure ALDA kernel. The only difference is that it obtains a broad net 
So the pure AUD kernel, we have the delta function, and here we have something which decays as uh, a sound R to the third power, and it's finite at the ability. So we get a density dependent problem. This is the number of cavities in the streets of this, this kernel. <coughs> okay, so I'll just say a little bit about spin because this is something which has given us uh, a lot of a lot of headache, and we've just very recently seen the way we do spin polarized calculations in this this setting. Because uh, I'm I'm not sure, man. I'm not sure there's a unique way to do it, but perhaps there is. So if you have suggestions, you can very glad to hear it. Okay. So if we have a spin polarized calculation, you can derive that if we have a spin pad system, then the, the kernel, uh, the, the non-spin dependent kernel should be equal to actually the average of four different spin polarized uh, components of the kernel. So uh, this is a minimal constraint. If we look at the pure ALDA harsh ring states kernel, it's uh, as a spin matrix, it would look something like uh, well, it would look like this. And we can one can see that this uh, these components here satisfy this equation. But this means we cannot just introduce a car from the diagonal, because then we would break this. So we have to do something else. And what we do is we just use the average, uh, or we just use actually the, the entire density for all the components here. So now it's, I mean, the structure is very different from uh, pure ADA in the spin polarized case, because it's, uh, it's not, it's not uh, only dependent on the uh, on the single spin densities here. But this turns out to be, I mean, this choice is not unique. We could also just have the two times the up density here, here, and two times the up density here, here. This would also satisfy the, uh, the constraint I showed before. But anyway, we break the spin scaling, and we cannot really regard this as a pure exchange um, kernel anymore. But um, I don't think it's that, that's a problem. One problem is that in, in RPA we can we calculate the full interactive response function and it only depends on the spin sums, non-interactive response function. Whereas here we need to calculate all the spin components of the full response function. And this gives uh, sort of memory issues when we do these calculations. Because I mean these individual components here are represented in our gain wave matrices, and so this, this matrix here can become very large in spin polarized calculations. So it's been um, it's been implemented in, in Gpol, and I think there's no general framework for PW correction for two-point functions. So what we do is we actually just use the all electron density when we evaluate the kernel, and it turns out that this actually converges nicely with grid spacing. And I think the reason for this is that then the regions where the all electron density oscillates a lot and um, it's very um, the attitude that density is typically very large, and for large densities, the, the kernel will approach zero. So we can calculate the absolute correlation entities for very simple systems. You will hydrogen atom, we get this start underestimation with RPA minus 13. We overestimate the correlation entity with ADA, and with RADA, we get a much better result. And similar for the um, for hydrogen molecule and uh, a helium atom. So the absolute correlation energy seems to be improved, like in the case of the homogeneous electron gas. So this is nice. It's of course more important to look at the at atomization energies of, of molecules. And um, this is shown here, this is the same plot as before, but now I've just also uh, uh, plugged in our this IRDA kernel. And we get the it seems to be much better, much better agreement with the uh, experiment. And also, it, it doesn't, well, it seems to, maybe it underlines a bit more, but it seems to sort of oscillate. Sometimes it gets a bit too, too small, and sometimes it gets a bit too high in the And one nice thing about this method is that we, our choice of input orbitals is, is essentially fixed by, by using the, the ARDA kernel, because I think it only makes sense to use um, LDA orbitals uh, for this when we use this kernel. Yeah, at least that's, that's in a sense consistent. And the mean absolute error is, uh, is significantly reduced in RPA and PB. We got 10 kilocalories per mole, and with this IAD we get now 2 kilocalories per mole. So this is also much better than PB, and it's actually also better than this 
uh, setting up screen exchange, which is another way of uh, improving RPA. Um, and it, so we are, we are sort of optimistic about this. Uh, this uh, so for solids, the situation becomes a bit tricky because um, we have this kernel which depends on R minus R prime, which means it's not periodic in the unit cell in the, in the coordinates. So if we evaluate it, we have to actually evaluate it in all unit cells. And because we have this dependence on the two-point density, we cannot represent this on the, uh, on the computer, so we have to loop over one of the variables and we have to do this uh, twice over all unit cells. It's a pretty big loop and it's, it's, um, it's, it's very slow. But anyway, it, it, it can be done, so if, if you're a bit uh, patient. So we've done it for a few sites, and um, um, that's what we're still waiting for, for results. Uh, a few of the intermediate here, but well, <laughs> starting with good news here with the um, carbon, or well, diamond structure is, is spot on, and um, silicon is also pretty, silicon pretty good, silicon carbide also pretty good. Uh, MDA, MDO is um, a bit, well, significantly better than RPA, but uh, well, we're, not, we're not quite near chemical accuracy yet. And for the, for the metals, we're not, um, <coughs> I mean, the improvement doesn't seem to be that good. But I think that the main problem with the metals is that the LDA reference for the single atom is not very good. For example, I've tried to do um, aluminum and do a PV ground state calculation instead, and then do I idea on top of that. And if I do that, I get right on top of the experimental value. So we would like to eventually do this or all of this with the uh, PD instead. So of course we also need to confirm that, that this new kernel doesn't destroy all the good properties of, uh, of RPA. So we've done this with the static correlation and dissociation of our hydrogen molecule and um, see the purple line here is the IRDA. It's pretty close to the experimental, or the, the CI calculations. Um, it's actually very similar also to the RPA, except that RPA is, is shifted by these two times this 0.6 EV for a single hydrogen atom. But if I if I plot this with respect to the to two hydrogen atoms, uh, I would be this, these two would be quite on top of each other. And um, it's a dynamical correlation, it's the mouse interactions, it's also just We've done this for bilayer graphene and gives um, gives a distance which is uh, right on top of RPA. It's slightly less binding energy than RPA, but the binding distance between the AS is, is the same. And also the long, the long range uh, tail here is uh, coincides. So we think that it, it reproduces uh, the, yeah, the PA results in these kind of systems. And just to sum up, um, this, this new kernel tends to uh, significantly improve uh, correlation energy, absolute correlation energies. It also improves the transition energies for small molecules and solids. And we uh, conserve this description of uh, dispersive interactions and static correlation. It also allows for straightforward theorization to uh, DDA, so you can do the exact same thing with uh, PV or RPV or, or meter DDAs, so just all that if you, if you would like. And um, some very preliminary results show that this, uh, do this with PDE, I actually get a uh, correlation energy for the hydrogen, hydrogen atom, which is less than a milli -week. So, this result we are very happy about because this should really be a fundamental thing that we get this number here close to, to zero. And uh, finally, we can also include the correlation part of the other guy, but that will be even more time to do. Okay, so thank you for the attention. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that, that is expensive. But it turns out that 
it's actually pretty hard to converse these calculations, also with, uh, with RPA. So what we do is we, we extrapolate from cutoffs in the range 300 to 500 V, and then we extrapolate to, to infinity. And this is, this, uh, this is quite accurate, but what you really need to, to use the same number of, of, of bands as uh, the number of, of plane waves you use. So but, yeah, this makes it easy. How important is the starting wave functions? I want to make the question in the, in the following sense. If you take RPA and you lose a consistent RPA, yeah. then the H2 doesn't dissociate well. Then basically, the, the, at the end, the yeah. sum of the two, and then basically what I'm trying to say is that all the problems that we are trying to solve are in case of the approximations that we are doing. Because none of the approximations that we do, unless we do not non set consistent, do dissociate well. No, I mean, yeah. but I think that <laughs> as far as, as, far as I'm, I mean, there's a few self-consistent calculations with, with that PA for, for molecules. And as far as, as I understand, I mean, it won't really solve the, this, uh, this underbinding for, for, for molecules. You'll, you'll still have that. I mean, so I think that you can solve some problems, but, but certainly not all by doing self-consistent uh, RPA. I think you will still have a lot of trouble. And certainly you will get you get the absolute value of the correlation energy which you will get wrong. And I think this will transfer I think this will transfer into bad cohesive entities and bad uh, bad optimization entities for molecules. But I don't know, I mean well we need someone to do all these subconsistent update calculations and also see if I can really solve anything. Uh, you are you're making a cutoff and I'm trying to understand the cutoff. Uh, normally you want to talk about the you know cut away the low Q uh, divergence of the correlation if this was the high Q. Q. You cut away the high Q. Okay. So we integrate from 0 to 2 pair. And we go we say, well, this one, we just set it to, we set the correlation hole to 0 okay. at, at the point where, at all points where Q is less than the 2 pair. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder about this uh, dissociation of H2, which is the classical problem, but yeah. uh, it's, it's solved when, when you do the spin probe yeah. solution yeah. in, yeah. in PBE or, or maybe also in LVA. So what comes out with, with this? What, what is that? If you break the spin symmetry, you know. If you break the spin symmetry in PP, then everything is okay. Then yeah. it dissociates to the right energy. But yeah. well, that's cheating, right? That's, <laughs> ah, I don't know. Anyway, but uh, I just just wonder what comes out here. Yeah. What what? We haven't. I mean, what comes out if you, if you are far apart? Yeah. <coughs> is it really? We haven't tried. I mean, but. But you have to write, you show the curve, right? Yeah, but, but this is not broken space. Uh... So this here. So this, this means there on each of the hydrogens there's half uh, up spin and half of the dumpy. Or what is there in the calculation? Well, what is here in this? Yeah, okay, yeah. so <coughs> it's not self-consistent, right? So we put it in some charm states, which is, I mean, Antibonding and bonding, so we get, you can still have two electrons in one atom in the dissociation limit. But it doesn't matter because I mean, the energy comes out, right? I mean, I think that you would also get an exact T. You would still get, uh, I mean, you still get completely wrong uh, wave function. But it doesn't matter because the functional can take care of it. I mean, it knows that, uh, how to treat it. Okay, thank you.